I hope you've had a chance to visit the exhibition Nature's Toolbox, Biodiversity, Art, and Invention. This exhibition is traveling, as Bob perhaps mentioned, it opened at the Field Museum in August of 2012. It traveled to the Leonardo, um, which is a children's science museum in Salt Lake City. Um, but this, at this point, this venue is the only one that is an art museum. And Artworks for Change, which curated this traveling exhibition, said that they were, and maybe they were being very nice, maybe very generous, said that they were most excited to hear how it goes at an art museum. And I think, uh, well, maybe I'm a little biased, but I believe that we really did do this nice exhibit some justice. So I mentioned it's been a wildly popular exhibition. Teachers from the district and the surrounding areas have been drawn to the interdisciplinary nature of this exhibition. Children truly have been engaged by the many moving parts and interactive nature of the installation. As we have for many years at the Ulrich, we partnered with National Geographic's Jason Project. And if you're unfamiliar with the Jason Project, it's uh, created in the spirit of Jason and the Argonauts, the mythological explorer. Uh, Wichita State's Fairmount Center for Science and Mathematics is one of six endowed locations. So there's a nice little bit of money that helps bring science curriculum to sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in the area. So each year, thankfully now in the fall, each year we partner with the Jason Project here on campus, and they bring anywhere from 800 to 1,200 very active sixth, seventh, and eighth graders to the museum. Yes, they all tour the exhibitions. We bring them together with art and science, and this all happens over the course of five to seven days. Now you know what week to maybe not come to the museum because it's always interesting. But likely the biggest hit during this, these tours this year was the work by Isabella Kirkland. Devoted to the flora and fauna of the rainforest, Isabella paints these very exacting representations in the style of Dutch still life of the 17th century. Lush and verdant, her paintings also stand in elegy to the endangered, the threatened, the extinct, and even the newly found species of Western science. Although an artist, she is also a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences, where his, she has documented biota in jeopardy of extinction for some 20 years. Isabella teaches at the San Francisco Art Institute and is also a science advisor. She holds degrees from the San Francisco Art Institute, Virginia Commonwealth University, I think I have yeah, VCU comes up a lot here at Wichita State. You're in good company. And the Worcester Museum School. Her work is in the collection of the prestigious Whitney Museum of American Art and here closer to home, the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Campus. And if you have not yet seen her TED Talk yet, well, I'm giving you some homework. You know what to Google tonight. Isabella Kirkland on TED Talks. Please join me in welcoming to the Ulrich Museum of Art, Isabella Kirkland. You readjust that as okay. um, we might have to dim the lights a little too. If somebody will do that, okay, great. Um, thank you so very much for having me here. I have only driven across Kansas, like a lot of people, uh, so I'm really happy to have stopped for a few days this time. Um, and unlike our former, the former illustrious speakers, I am really a lone operator. I spend a lot of time by myself, but my main collaborators are scientists. Um, I'm gonna, there's one housekeeping note. If there's a question about whether an image is hand painted or a photograph, if it has a date, it's my image and I painted it. Um, this quote from Linnaeus is really rather pertinent to everything I'm going to talk about today uh, because it is my contention that the art world, at least as I understand it, the gallery system, museums, collectors, 
all of those things rely on this concept of an art object as as a primary object. It's something that has power because of that. Um, if you go to a place, a tourist place, and they've remade some ersatz reproductions of something, they don't count the same way a reproduction at the Met does that has even a few fragments that are archeological artifacts. Um, and is that, is that intention or is that authentication or is it where the object is shown? You know, an example might be Duchamp's fountain. Um, he, the original of this object was lost so in the 60s, Duchamp made uh, a, s a set of reproductions, and those are what are actually in museums now. And I mean, they always have a little sign that says this is not original, but the idea that there would be originals of a mass-produced product is amusing. Um, you know, they were mass-produced in the first place. And I'm in kind of a similar predicament with my work because uh, although I would love to have had the originals come to Kansas and the other venues, um, they have become too expensive to travel that way. Um, and they belong, they're um, in collection themselves, so I no longer have the access to them that I would like. I try to paint plants and animals, the plants and animals that I study, and paint them as if they were alive to sort of give them that same... Um, authenticity of an original object. These are uh, ivory-billed woodpeckers. I couldn't decide whether to count them as endangered, uh, hoping that they might be found, or as extinct, which they probably are. So I didn't put them in any painting, but the day that that news story broke that they might have been found, I started this painting. Um, one of the things that I get to do in my position sort of with a foot in two worlds, is see the original objects to hold, I've held these in my hand, I've studied them very close up. Um, and when you look at the tail veins, you see how they're pointed at the end? That's because they're worn. And the vein of the tail feathers is about as thick as a pencil and rigid. And so they actually rear back on those and use them as a fulcrum. Um, it's the kind of little thing you wouldn't know without holding the original object. Uh, not that many people get to see this stuff, and it, it took me a long time to gain clearance as well, and I was fortunate to do so. Um, in researching some other uh, extinct species, I came across this page with just two feathers on it, and the bo oops, sorry, I knew I was going to do that. Um, the one on the bottom is actually from a, a bird called the double-banded Argus pheasant. I don't know whether you've ever seen an Argus pheasant. They're ex extraordinary birds. Well, this feather is all that is left of an extinct species, this one feather. So I had to include you know, a painting of uh, a single feather to in represent a whole species. There's been DNA work done on it, and it is, in fact, a very different species. Um, Every time I go into a natural history museum, I'm absolutely floored by the staggering millions of human hours of work that have gone into not only collecting the objects in the first place, but uh, cleaning them, preserving them, pressing them if they're plants, and cataloging them. It's uncountable human hours. Um, just my home institution alone, California Academy of Sciences, has over two million fish specimens in the ichthyology department. So it is, you know, it's a vast achievement over a long period of time. So I'm relying on something like that same primacy of the original object in order to try to carry my work safely into the future. I try to make paintings that are very durable. I use the latest conservation methods known. And um, if an object, in, in my understanding of art history, if an object is either beloved enough or expensive enough, it has a good chance of escaping fire, flood, war, those sort of things. I'm counting on that. Um, and also, paintings are analog. Um, 
you know, if we had one solar flare of the, or solar storm, the size of one that happened in the 1870s, uh, it could wipe out the internet. So I like this idea of, there, of this being an analog pursuit. Um, wait, yeah, you would ask why those are there, but there is a reason. Um, I never wanted to be anything but an artist my whole life. And my troll dolls had a three-story apartment house with canopy beds, down pillows, skis, sleds, homemade food, tennis rackets, sweaters I knitted on toothpicks, uh, mostly made out of garbage <laughs> and scraps. So it's just that it's been a lifelong pursuit. I never wanted to do anything else. Um, I began my adult art making life as a sculptor, trying to combine two and three dimensions, really sort of sculpted paintings and painted sculptures. And for a good 15 years, I built transitory um, installations. The last one I built had 2,222 individual parts. And I know because I counted them. <laughs> I was curious. Um, that included um, about an inch deep artificial leaves I made out of one entire New York City white pages. And I thought people would walk through them. That was the idea. I had microphones and I expected people to walk through them and no one would touch them. I was very disappointed. Um, I still make sculptural objects. Um, and I was going to show you one, but I lost the slide last night. I, I built an electric paintbrush hoping it would make me go faster. Um, um, one of the things that I loved about taxidermy was this transformation that takes place. You know, you start with a dead animal, you get rid of all the parts that won't last, that will rot, and, and one of the last steps is to wash the skin. And with a bird in particular, when you wash it, it looks kind of like a wet Kleenex with some hair attached. It looks really pathetic. And then you blow dry it, and all of a sudden you're holding this bird sleeve. I mean, it's just this magnificent thing that happens. And then you build another body. It, that's complicated and a long sculptural process, but, but really fascinating. And you can change this little thing that looks like nothing into this magnificent representation of a bird that you get to look up look at very closely and see that they have eyelashes and they have, um, you know, as this one does, um, coverts to their nostrils. Because I know taxidermy and I'm a painter, I got to go on a birding expedition to the maritime provinces of Papua New Guinea two years ago. We were hoping we would find some new species there. Um, we did not, unfortunately, but I did get to take a record of about 500 different birds and hope to do something with that book one day. Um, it was a fantastic experience. Um, and even these little watercolors have something that I really love, which is taking your own observations, a little bit of knowledge, some ground minerals, and a vehicle and turning that into a believable semblance of something that's living. Um, these are my field notes for the passenger pigeon. One of the reasons that I study the great Dutch masters of the world, the two, my two favorites, Jan David Sundahim and Rachel Roish, is because they were so adept at making things look lifelike. Um, I don't know why I've gotten stuck on this, but hopefully I can explain it a little bit more. They were great representation masters. That's the way I think of them. They represented nature in a way that froze it in time. Rachel Royce also had 10 children. Um, they were, the Dutch masters were very successful. The still life masters were very, very successful in their own time. So they jealously guarded all of their trade secrets. Um, Dahim passed them down to Rachel Royce because she was his student. And because they had this, um, a veracity that was hard for your own eyes to deny, the paintings were almost as expensive as the um, 
particularly the tulip bulbs were themselves. At one point, a particular flame tulip sold for the house of, uh, price of a house right on the canal in Holland, I mean in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, the next best thing to owning a, a tulip of great quality was to own an image of it in bloom perpetually. Their work has held value over four centuries. Um, their high economic value really was their endurance insurance. It's, it's why they were kept safe during wars and, and all the ravages of time. I once looked at, I hope I can remember which one it is now. I believe it's this painting here. And there were 42 different insects in one two by three foot painting. All of them you could identify to the genus probably, not to the species necessarily. I go to see a lot of animals in zoos, a lot of plants in botanical gardens and herbaria. Often I have to just go visit a close relative of something I'm studying because I can't gain access to the thing itself where it's too prohibitively far away and expensive. Um, and I spend a lot of time, I mean, you know, just even looking at a close relative, I can understand something about the way an animal moves or the way a group of plants grow that you might not be able to discern from the original scientific description or from, certainly not from photographs, since those are artifacts of a, certain, of a different type. Um, you know, my own photographs are pretty crappy, as you can tell, but they tell me information I'm trying to re remind myself of. Um, I spend a lot more time in natural history museums inside the museum looking at preserved specimens because preserved specimens really are the truest reference sources for my work. And I have to become really pretty intimately familiar with each species in order to paint it correctly. This is a self-assigned job. Nobody told me I should do it this way, but because I have and because I've sort of determined that I want to use a fact based representation, it has given me the credibility to have continued access to the original objects, which has been wonderful. Uh, we have plant pressings, we have bones and fur, horns, feathers, and in some cases that's all we have of species, is these little remains, and we have a good bit of remorse as well. Um, this painting, Canopy, from 2008, sort of represents, for me, the culmination of 25 years of trying to learn to paint like the Dutch masters. Um, I taught myself. I've never really had a painting class. And what I, one of the things I hope to gain by painting in their style and in the, using some of their methods is a similar longevity, because I think given the subject matter I've covered, the paintings themselves may have historical significance for people 400 years from now. A lot of the species I've depicted will not be here, maybe more than I am afraid will, which would be great. Um, so I really kind of want them to operate as a, as a snapshot an ecological snapshot of our time period and how we relate to ourselves as animals and how we relate the rest of the world, the rest of the natural world as not us. We have a very separate vision of ourselves. Um, this painting canopy resulted also partly from a fascination I had with these micro orchids that grow all over Costa Rica and particularly the higher elevation. There's uh, I was able to study them because of a, the guidance of a wonderful man named Carl Luer, who's the king of small orchids. Um, and each thing that I've studied has had some guardian angel like that in the sciences who's given me their time freely, enough for me to gain enough understanding to paint accurately. Almost every painting of any scale I've made in the past 20 years has taken me nearly a year to complete. Um, 
I would really like to go faster, but I just don't know how. Um, you know, most of the paintings begin as a database of things that fit whatever subject I'm working on. They go through a research phase of photographing and measuring and scale drawings uh, from lots of different sources. And I, from an architect friend, got in the habit of using vellum and tracing paper so that I don't ever lose a drawing that's good. I'll just keep reworking sections and put them together and then trace them over again. It's a very handy tool. Um, and uh, I learned that that was a paying gig, working for architects, building models, scale models. And after my trolls, it was pretty easy work, really. Um, this is the kind of reason that it takes so long, though. I went to the uh, National Academy of Science in Philadelphia to visit their malacology collection because they have the biggest grouping of Hawaiian tree snail shells, and I wanted to be able to put all 10 species in the painting gone. They're all extinct. Um, and then finally I get to paint for a while, which is great. Um, it's sort of the perfect torture and the perfect joy, that's the way I describe it, because even though this little montage I'm showing you makes it look really easy, I have days when I wipe out everything I did, days where I sand off the previous day's work. Um, but this one actually went pretty smoothly. There's still a Dutch trick that I have not mastered, and that is brush loading. Only another painter would even understand what I'm talking about. But they had a way of, of taking their brush and actually putting a tiny strip of red here, a tiny strip of brown here, and a green here, and they would make one perfect stroke that laid all three colors down. Very tricky, but I'm working on it. Um, some days I go into my easel and think, oh, I can do leaves today, but, but that's all. Or, you know, some days are bird days. Um, but for the most part, I get really lost when I'm painting. I think a lot of artists get in this similar state, complete flow state, where I look back and I don't even know how I did something because I really was so in the moment that I didn't really track it. Um, I, I really live to be in that state. That's the completed composition of Gone. The original is three feet by four feet and uh, has 63 species of plants and animals that are extinct at the full species level. Uh, they've gone extinct, I usually say, since the invention of world-crossing sailing ships and firearms. You know, there's, there's sort of two different things about the paintings. One is trying to get the species right, you know, with the right expression, the right balance, the right growth pattern, vein pattern, feather pattern. But then there's usually several months that I forget to account for where I try to make it all work together. Um, and sometimes I have to back up and rethink things. This is a, a long-tailed hopping mouse that's extinct. Oh, darn it, I did it again. I keep wanting to use the pointer. Um, this is an egg from the pink-headed duck. It's the only round bird egg we've ever known. I went to visit those, the largest collection of, er, of um, bird eggs in the world is at Tring in Herefordshire. And that's called oology. Great word if you do a crossword puzzle. Uh, this is a lay that's in the same picture that is made from uh, two species of extinct birds. And it brings up, again, that sort of idea of the primary object. Because the birds are extinct, the Hawaiians could not possibly make another of these lays. And it had enormous cultural significance. Is it better off in the museum where it's curated, or would it be better off with the Hawaiians in native ceremony? This is a question that doesn't have an answer. Um, but it definitely talks to that idea of there being a primary object. Uh, this is a little trick on the left there of, of building reflections in and having, you know, you, when you don't think about it, you might see it in a photograph, but you don't realize that a colored object next to another color object will inform both of them. Um, so, 
all of the paintings, each of the paintings in this whole suite of work I've done have sort of grown from one to another, and they all cover one specific theme. In 1999, when I first had this sort of brainstorm, you know, the millennium was coming up, change to the 2000s was scary for some. Um, I had just seen a, my first exhibit of Dutch master paintings in the still life tradition, and I got a mailer from the Sierra Club, the 100 most endangered species in the United States. After building transitory junk that I had a hard time storing for a really long time, I thought of, I would maybe try to make something that would really last a long time as a sort of a lark, really. Um, but I really wanted to make some contribution that was a more lasting comment and something that was in a broader texture. Uh, some friends had founded an organization called the Long Now Foundation. Um, built around the idea of fostering long-term thinking. So instead of having a corporation make a four-year plan, make them have a 50-year plan. Instead of building something to last 10 years and be sold, build something to last for 50 years and endure. So it was sort of a perfect conjunction of all of these different, all these different ideas that made me make this first experiment of painting things that are endangered in the United States. And it succeeded uh, way beyond my wildest expectations. And then, unfortunately, I made it on a really terrible homemade panel. And I have since started using really good museum-grade uh, materials because there's no reason to spend a whole year on something to have it fall apart. Um, the idea of ascendant species obviously came right out of the idea of endangered species. All of my reading about endangered species suggested that Often they're just being outcompeted by something that's been introduced. And I decided to name the paintings Ascendant and Descendant to try to remove that human judgment that the invasives are bad. They're just succeeding. They're doing well. Um, one of the reasons I do this work is political motivation. I like to let the images be used for free by um, nonprofit groups and ecologically minded organizations. They've been used by the UN and Bioneers and Fila Day and Traffic International, etc. cetera. Um, uh, it's, it's a great way to get, you know, have my own ideas shared around the world because painting's kind of a lonely pursuit and you can only sell it once. Um, this was, I, I violate my own rule in every painting somewhere, and this brown tree snake was the one violation to the rule, but, because that's in Guam, which really doesn't belong, belong to the United States, but we do have a big military presence there. Um, and I, I painted this, this was the first time I could go out and chop stuff down and paint from life. I was so excited. <laughs> you know, I was chopping down kudzu and bringing it into the place I was working every day. And, um, I painted it outdoors in a North Carolina summer, so every time I look at it, I get hot. <laughs> um, I spent the next year, I spent the year of 2000, 2001 in London, so my focus got to be much more international. I had access to all these great museums of such wonderful depth in Europe. And another thing that influences um, endangerment of species is trade, because once there are not very many of something, it has a very high black market value, which is cuts directly across, it's a total cross purposes from trying to conserve. So everything in this painting is endangered in one way or another by either black market trade or gray market trade. Um, and gray market trade really refers to something like this Fakatahachi ghost orchid, which was mentioned a lot in the Orchid Thief, if you saw that movie. This is what they were looking for. It exists really 90% of the year just as bare um, sort of roots. They actually do the photosynthesis, so they're in between a root and a leaf. Uh, so it's pretty hard to find. And then once a year, they put out this fantastic orchid. And they are, you know, a great collector's item if you're an orchid fancier. Um, the same applies for shells and other groups of plants like the carnivorous plants. In fact, there was a great uh, group of them right behind my sister's house and 
just a couple of weeks before I visited in spring, someone came up and dug about 75% of them up overnight. This little painting called Bunny Meeting was, one of, was a series of um, pictures I did on new species. I did a lot of studies, uh, partly because I uh, had a hard time learning to paint again after a serious health crisis. So I did a lot of studies on the new species, and as I was working on the f um, descendant and ascendant trade and whatever that other one is, um, I, every time I would go meet some scientists and say, you know, I'd really like to look at this and this and this in the collection, they would say, mm, okay, but you should really see this thing I just found in Lagos. You know, they were always really excited about the new stuff. So I had just been collecting and collecting, figuring I'd make one painting of new species, and instead I had so much material, I decided to make four. Um, and just present them as imaginary rainforest layers. Um, I love watching a grown man look like an eight-year-old because they're so excited. Um, about fifth, this is a painting, not a photograph, sorry. I, didn't, I forgot to put a date on that one. Um, something like 15% of the biota of the planet has actually been named, which means there's a ton of stuff out there to find. Granted, a lot of it's small at this point, but we, it was only about six years ago they realized that even the elephant we thought of as one species is actually two. There's a savanna, the big gray ones we normally think of. There's actually a forest elephant and a savanna elephant, and they don't mate. They don't cross. Um, so this little thing is a passiflora. It's called Passiflora tarminiana. It's all over Hawaii. It grows all over everything. People hate it. They chop it down with axes. But nobody had ever written up a scientific description and given it a name until about 2002. Uh, this painting is called Forest Floor. It was, it's all new species. Everything in this picture is new to Western science. Since the enactment of the Endangered Species Act in 1983, that was the cutoff point. Um, another big reason that I make this work is really just to try to shift people's perspective about our role in the wider world. And one way I try to do that is to get people to slow down. Um, and these paintings take a long time to look at. There's a lot in them. And because they're painted so up to such a gnat's heel, it makes people get in close. And then the painting will fill your whole field of vision. So you feel like you're there, sort of, I hope. Um, you know, there's that, there's a slow food movement. This, I'm part of the slow art movement. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, my husband used to do, run an audio tour company and, and he once calculated that the average viewer in a museum spends between five and seven seconds in front of an artwork. And probably the greatest compliment I ever got was from a security guard in Toledo who was worried sick that people were going into a room that had only three of my paintings in there and they were spending an hour. I mean, he, this was just so wrong. And I was like, yes! Um, understory is you know, it's, that's sort of the second layer up in this imaginary rainforest I've painted. Um, again, full of new species. I particularly want to point out to you this little, is that working now? Yeah. Um, yes, there it is. This is a, a flying lizard, you know, a gliding lizard, truly. And in the original painting, you can actually see his ribs through the leaf. And I, I had to put that in there because it commemorated a moment when I was walking in Costa Rica in Monteverde, or maybe Manuel Antonio, I don't remember. Um, and I had a really young naturalist with me, gave me a great compliment. He said, you walk like a man. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and uh, he was kind of leaning against a tree and telling me about something, rather, I don't remember. And I, I just pointed straight up, and there was an eyelash viper silhouetted just like that, about a foot over his head. <laughs> Um, so I like to remember that. Um, this is a new species of tarsier. And in this four by five foot painting, he's the only thing looking at you. Everything else in the painting is staring at some other creature. Um, where am I? 
Oh, another way I try to capture people's attention and get them to sort of, I mean, my work gets dismissed a lot, just as pretty paintings, I think, actually. Um, but you can sort of go as far as you want in researching it. I always give people plenty of information to look at, links to websites, you know, species list, keys, the whole nine yards. Um, and another way I try to grab people's attention is through telling the stories of individual species. So this is an odd creature. It doesn't look very nice when it's been pickled. Um, but it's called a gastric brooding frog because the adults actually swallow the fertilized eggs. And they are hatched in the belly. So somehow this frog is able to turn off its entire digestive system, all the enzymes, Everything that's going on in its stomach stops when the eggs are there. Um, and in my painted version, I actually have a tiny frog there in the mouth. They crawl up the esophagus and hop right out of the adult's life, I mean mouth, and then they, his stomach starts working again. I mean, this could have enormous uh, ramifications in human health if we could understand this. Um, Dietary, just dieting alone, you could make a lot of money. Um, oh, I've lost myself again, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, the, this is the kind of thing I think about. So why did that get started and how did it get started and what, you know, what, what made that happen possibly? And then I'll, then I'll think, well, okay, moths, if you watch them fly, they'll go straight across a field, and when they get to the porch light, they go bloop, 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 bloop. Why, why, why can they dry, go straight across a field, and then they're, they're going around like they don't know where they're going once they're across the field? And then why are undersea creatures like this nudibranch and things like fairy wrasses and, I mean, fairies, basslets, and wrasses, why are they so brightly colored? Underwater, they're all gray. Um, you know, the, the water just refracts the red spectrum. So, why are they that color? And this is kind of what I think about when I'm lying awake at night. <laughs> um, you know, here's a nudibranch. It, this is this is a different nudibranch. They're all they're all so there's such crazy diversity in them. This one actually has an eye spot right there, but it's not an eye like we know. It's only a a light sensor. It can tell light from dark, and that is all. So obviously they're not talking to each other about. They're not signifying with color to each other. So who who the heck knows? Um, but I've gotten so interested in nudibranchs that. I'm now working on a painting of 206 species of nudibranchs, starting from about four millimeters, which is as small as I think I can paint recognizably, um, down to 300 millimeters. Um, that's kind of an aside. I got off the track here a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, everything has a story, you know? That's, that's, that's what really drives me to do this. I'm just fascinated by learning all this stuff. So this is a little wren that was, you, you see, I mean, there's no tail, really. He does actually have some tail feathers. They're about this long um, and really short round wings. And it's an island species. So they're basically flightless. And in 18 something or other, David Leal lived on a lighthouse on Stephen Island off the coast of New Zealand. And he, being a good British sort of citizen, naturalist, he sent a, um, one of these little birds that his cat caught to the British Museum to see whether it was new. And lo and behold, it's a completely new plant, but in between the time when he sent the bird to Britain and got it back, which could have been eight months or a year back then, his cat, Tibbles, caught almost every single bird on the island, and the bird's now extinct. Um, this has a little more, oh, there's the bird the way I painted it. Great big feet, stubby little wings. Um, beautiful, beautiful, subtle pattern in the feathers. This is maybe a little more close to home. This is a freshwater clam, actually. There are thousand, probably, species of freshwater clams and mussels in the upper drainages of the Mississippi River system. Uh, they're very highly endemized. Some of them exist only in one creek. 
And a lot of things influenced their demise. One siltation from farming and, and forestry practices, damming, uh, agricultural runoff. They've had everything thrown at them. Um, but they, one, one of the really big hits they took was the westward, ex during the westward expansion of the US, people would stop you know, at the Mississippi to gear up to head west. And they all bought new clothes, and they all closed with buttons made from these shells. Um, another, you know, they also, they're also periodically freshwater pearls get to be really popular. And I'm not wearing any at the moment, but it does make you wonder. <laughs> um, this was in the news, uh, this is also in understory. This was in the news as um, the Harry Potter plant. And I put it in because I thought maybe kids would get a kick out of it. It's, uh, it's a plant called Macrocarpia apparata. It's a night-blooming gentian. And it was discovered by a guy who's become a friend. Um, you know, two tired, hungry, dirty, disappointed botanists trudging home to their camp. And this white flower just sort of loomed up out of the mist. And they said it apparated like Harry Potter. They'd been looking all day, and they'd been by the thing like five times and didn't notice it. Um, so I thought it was really cool and wanted to include it. It has a very, very complicated structure. I've never seen anything grow like it, and so I should find some more and learn more, but I haven't yet. Um, it grows in, in a, you know, it has a central bowl that goes up straight, and then it, it grows in alternating Vs, so the branches go off like that, you know, at 90 degrees to each other. And so I actually had to build a scale model in order to be able to figure out how it would look in perspective because it was so unusually, had such an unusual growth pattern. And then, in addition, it's got a really complicated vein pattern. Um, so I asked my friend, the scientist, well, do you, I thought he was attached to the University of Ohio. So I said, well, do you have specimens? And he said, yeah, I'll FedEx them to you. Which I thought, great. And then when I went, when I went to pick them up, um, I didn't realize that he was FedExing them from Switzerland. And when I had to return them, it ended up cost me like five hundred dollars to look at them. But um, it was worth it because <laughs> I think I have them right. Um, anyway, there's also, uh, you know, it's like every every single thing in these paintings has a story like this. Um, and so, stop me if I'm if I'm going over. This is a black-footed ferret. You guys know this well. This is from your neck of the woods. Um, you know, I was reading somewhere that they think between the bison and the gazillion and 12 prairie dogs that these guys used to prey on, that that actually made this unarable land where you live except the water that filled the Oglala Aquifer, which I think is pretty amazing. And without them, you know, we all know the aquifer is being drained horribly by fracking and other things. Um, so, um, the, because I did this painting Gone, uh, I got, and also I'm a founding member of the Long Now Foundation, uh, they've, I've allowed them to use the image whenever they want, and there was sort of a new branch of Long Now developed recently that's called Revive and Restore. And actually, that's what my TED Talk is on. Um, the idea of Revive and Restore was to bring back the passenger pigeon and to do it through genetic re-engineering. Um, there was a conference in March, I think, of this past year in, at National Geographic where the idea was hashed out and talked over from every angle, the moral, the safety, the health, everything, with lots of people saying nay and yay. Um, and at first, I thought it was absolutely cuckoo. <laughs> what a waste of money, you know, I was thinking. And then, and then I thought, but we've been genetically engineering stuff for years. We just do it the slow way. And, and then it seemed, started seeming not so foreign. Um, and it's happening already, whether we want it to or not, with crops and crops. And for all we know, we don't know where that drift is going to go yet. So we may be doing it already without knowing it. Um, 
I went to a talk the other day by Adam Stelzner from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who was the guy who designed that sky crane, which is, it looks ridiculous in drawings. It's how they actually got the most recent Mars rover from, from the thing that got it through the atmosphere safely and slowly and carefully down onto the surface of Mars without raising a giant cloud of dust. And, and it looks like it could be designed by a 12-year-old. And when he was trying to raise money for it, this is what he kept saying, that sometimes a, the beginning stages of incredible progress and incredible folly look the same. And so I've tried to use that attitude as I've thought more about de-extinction. Um, I'm on the listserv, so I've been listening, you know, reading about it now for about six or eight months. And actually, the concept has blossomed into a very different discussion. It's about how far are we willing to go to save an endangered species or to save an apex predator. And if it's, you know, the black-footed ferret... Oh, I did it again. Um, where did I go? There we go. The black-footed ferret when its numbers were reduced, granted, almost succumbed to canine distemper. What if we could tweak the gene just to make it immune to canine distemper? Would that hurt? Would it save the species? We don't know. Um, ditto with the frog. There are really possible incredible benefits to understanding how this works, how this turning off the digestive system works. Um, and the Xerxes blue, one of the first um, insects we know of to go extinct from the 1940s where San Francisco meets the sea in the sand dunes. Um, there's a, the Insect Conservation Society called the Xerxes Society is actually carefully watching what scientists working with Revive and Restore are doing because they think there's a tussock moth that eats what the caterpillars of this butterfly needed in order to survive. So if they could just alter the tussock moth or the plant, then there might be a way to bring this butterfly back. Um, it's, you know, I'm not advocating anything. I'm just throwing it out because it's an interesting subject. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of talk in Tasmania and Australia about bringing back the thylacine. It was the apex predator before dingoes were introduced. It was shot, trapped, poisoned like mad uh, because they thought it would kill sheep. And we now know from the shape of their jaw muscles and the way their jaw is built, it's not, their jaw isn't wide enough for them to grab a sheep and bring it down. They, they preyed on kangaroos and smaller marsupials. Um, and birds, and so it could change the face of Australia to have the Tasmanian wolf, quote unquote, back. Um, you know, each one of these extinctions, um, it just emphasizes the unintended consequences of our own actions. Uh, Gone is the only painting I've done that actually speaks to extinction directly, but it kind of lurks behind the subject of every other one. And even Nova, you know, I was so excited when I was doing that work because I'd done six years of utterly depressing research on things just down, down, down. So doing the Nova work was really fun because they were all new. And then I started looking into their IUCN number, the, you know, International Union of Concerned Scientists, their, um, their status, and probably 80% of them are vulnerable at best. So extinction, to reiterate your point, it's lurking everywhere. Um, and no matter what phyla you look at, whether you look at birds or plants, the complexity of the individual life of that species just goes deeper and fractally deeper the more you look. And the scientists I trust are the ones who say they don't know anything. The ones I don't trust are the ones who say they do because every single thing you look at just gets more complex as you know more. Um, I can't remember if there's anything after this or not. Let's find out. Um, oh yeah, back to my nudibranchs. Um, 
you know, we've been just sort of tossing monkey, monkey wrenches blindly into these systems and our planetary systems for reproduction and breathing and recycling, and, and we can't know what those are. We can't know what the repercussions are. Uh, we're not smart enough yet. So I have some ifs, um, and if I can answer any of those positively, I think I will have done my job. Um, one is that if I, my work can contribute to sort of the overall conversation we're having about how we fit in with the rest of the planet. If I can f inspire a few young people to go into the absolutely dirtbag paying um, natural sciences, that would be great. Um, if my work can inspire a few of the right people to throw their efforts in the direction of conservation, that would be great. Um, if I can change anybody's perspective, that would be great too. And that's kind of what I think artists are supposed to do, right? Thank you very much. Oh, okay, great. Oh, sure, yeah. I did not get to see any birds of paradise. Um, most of the atolls we were, um, oh, I'm sorry, yes, of course. Uh, most of the atolls we were looking at did not have sufficient elevation. I wasn't in the highlands. I did see, I did see feathers of bower birds and two bowers, but no birds. Oh, yes. Feathers, absolutely. We went to the Alatau Canoe Festival, which was a trip and a half, and there were feathers and furs from everything there represented. Um, but I did not see the living birds. You really have to get pretty far up into the highlands to see them. Um, it's, from Alatau, it's certainly a good 12 to 16 hours to get up high enough to see them. And you need to go with somebody who knows what they're doing. Yes. I have not. Um, I'm married to a surfer, so I tend to go to places that have surf. They don't, they're not always my birding destinations, but I do birding wherever I go. Ah, um, when I started working on this, I just called up my local science museum and asked questions and started using the library so that I would know enough to be able to speak intelligently um, and have my questions be very specific so that they could be answered without taking a lot of time. Um, and I was just really dogged. Uh, it took me six months to get into the collection of Kew Gardens in about 12 letters. So persistence always pays off. But people really are, are very generous sharing their expertise in my experience. So particularly when, you know, I mean, what I'm doing is beneficial to this particular group. So, um. oh, travel? No, no, I, um, I've done, you know, I should have put up my resume of all the jobs I've done for money because it's much longer than my art resume. Um, at the moment, I'm sponging off my husband. Um, but what I try to do is gang, like if I know I need to go to Tring in Hertfordshire, England, I'll try to wait until I have enough work that I can spend two days there, or four days there, and just work flat out. You know, try to gang things together um, had I really been smarter, I would have tagged a trip to Mobot on here, but I, I did not this time. <laughs> Next time. Um, anything else I can answer for someone? No? Thank, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Everything's freehand. Um, Camera lucida? Yes. Yeah, camera obscura, not lucida, excuse me. Um, yes, you know, I've actually thought about publishing a book similar to that one. Um, 
I've been looking at still lives a lot, and in every single book I have, 95% of them have the light coming over your left shoulder. And I do that automatically without thinking about it, and that's because I'm right-handed. Before the advent of artificial light, in order to not have your own hand in the shadow of your work and be able to see what you were looking on, you had to have the light from this direction. And I think it was only people who were left-handed that set it up the other way. And for right-handed people, it just feels natural. I actually purposely put the light from the left in a small picture, and it just felt awkward. Um, I have not written that paper, so don't steal it, please, but <laughs> I hope I'll get to it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. I appreciate that.